नो ब्रेकफास्ट और द सीक्रेट ऑफ लाइफ बाय गॉसिप थॉमस सी लोथियन इंट्रोडक्शन वेन आई बिगेन टू टेल द स्टोरी इट वॉज विद द आइडिया दैट बिफोर आई हैड रिटर्न वॉट वॉज इन माई हैड I would be able to read Dr. Juvis book on the true science of living. Unfortunately, I have not read it yet, but I have read another of his, A New Era for Women. It was exceedingly helpful and I trust that Dr. Juve will forgive me if I have stolen his ideas. According to Kipling, I have but imitated Homer. When Homer struck his blooming lyre he heard men sing by land and sea and what he thought he might require he went and took the same as me dr juvis philosophy appealed to me because it was the missing link in my own teaching it fired me to tell the story and i have done so in my own way i am not able to write such a book as dr juvi has done because i am not juvi but i should like to have done so for his message stirred me to the depths of my soul i had a message to deliver to my fellow men and i here by sent it forth with all its imperfections thick upon it only pleading for kindly criticism on the ground of earnestness what i have said is true the message itself is full of salvation for the race and whatever faults there are in this little book are due to the faulty messenger and not to the story he had to tell may it do all the good the writer deserves it to do gossip number 17 castle reach street sydney new south wales november 1905 No Breakfast or The Secret of Life by Gossip Thomas C Lothian Chapter 1 The First Signs For years past I have been preaching about the great secret which makes all the mysteries of life as plain and easy as ABC It explains why sin and sorrow abound on the earth and why the nations hate each other and why the sects and creeds quarrel and why we live and why we die and all sorts of things. It explains the doom of the unbaptized and why the masses are not at church and a thousand other problems. And then there is no secret about it after all. It is so simple that a wayfaring man even though a fool need not err therein. Jesus Christ preached it and taught it but it is hidden from the present generation owing to the hardness of their hearts. Our children or our children's children will understand it and will wonder at our blindness. I would tell it to you all but you would stone me to death for it and truth needs no martyrs. at least i don't think it needs to be so i am saying nothing about it or very little having learned one great secret and found how foolishly simple it was my mind was quite prepared to accept other great secrets and they came to me and to my intense surprise i find that i have known them all the time the other day i turned up some of my writings of 20 years ago and lo i seemed to have grasped the secret then but i had not I quoted Young's lines then too. The very law that molds it here and bids it trickle from its source, that law preserves the earth as pure and guides the planets in their course. It seemed to me then, twenty years ago, that I understood the simplicity of God's laws, but I didn't. I said I did and I believed I did for I had assented to the facts of law in an intellectual way but I can see now that I had not realized them had not sensed them had not grasped the simplicity of them and now I look back and smile Kepler had a good idea of the attraction of gravitation but it remained for Newton to demonstrate it Kepler understood the force but Newton proved the law of the force. He showed us that if the law was what he thought it was the moon should fall round the earth in 28 days and it does. 
and that force tumbles the toddling babe down the stone steps of your own house and breaks your china teacup and keeps suns and worlds systems and stars in order the laws of god are few and simple but we mix things up so that we make life itself into a complicated movement instead of a simple one Life is horribly simple, so simple that we are forever craving devotion and pastime. We fear the horrors of the simple life and fly to drink and drugs and doctors and horse racing and smoking and gambling and dancing just to be diverted from what? From life. What a man can win too in this life is happiness. The highest happiness is the simplest but we fail to realize that until we have found the failure of the complicated sort One of the most miserable men in the world is John D Rockefeller the American millionaire but we would nearly all change with him in spite of that We think we would be happy if we were rich but we wouldn't There is no happiness apart from work what we all want is happiness that can only be obtained by having a sound mind in a sound body and by using the body rightly but the world is full of doctors and drug stores and quacks and nostrum mongers and there are very few in it who are really well the world is filling up with weaklings and the schools for doctors are crowded life grows more complicated and fevered and restless and unhappy all the time People were never so well off in the world before as we are in Australia today and they never were more restless or discontented Civilization and complication do not bring happiness you all realize that but where is the remedy i know it can i tell it yes i could tell it in two words but few would understand it i would be hooted out of town if i told you the secret it is as simple as the force of gravitation It is as simple as the sermon on the mount but as difficult to follow. Shall I tell you in two words what it is? No, I will tell you how I found it out. When we were coming from England last time, there was a young man about 28 years of age who sat at our table and professed himself a vegetarian. Now I am willing to confess though I do it with shame that a vegetarian is one of my pet aversions. They are uncomfortable people to live with. They are faddists and you don't know what to do with them when they visit you. It is difficult to know what to give them to eat and it makes you feel mean to have your guest eating potatoes and cabbage while you are eating mutton or beef or fowl. Vegetarians make me feel unhappy. Besides that, they have nearly always got some other craze. They are trinitarians or millenarians or atheists or dentists or something peculiar i like my friends to be companionable and not faddy of course there are nice vegetarians just as there are nice dentists but taking them full and large they are uncomfortable people to deal with this young man looked unhappy and peevish but inoffensive and i dislike inoffensive people so i cared not for him He took no breakfast either and I wondered how he lived. He ate cabbage and potatoes and bread and butter and tea and cakes part of the day and took no breakfast to start the day with. He looked to me like a feeble-minded crank and so he was. I wanted to be just to him though for I am always ashamed of my prejudices. So one day I fell to talking with him on deck and I asked him why he was a vegetarian. It was a fair question and I think a man should be always prepared to give a reason for the faith that is in him no matter how foolish it may seem. He said he was a vegetarian because it suited his health best. He looked like a feeble valetudinarian as it was so I wondered what he would be like if he ate meat. Then I asked him quite nicely of course why he took no breakfast. He said that his father had all the books that ever were written on the subject and was fully charged with the philosophy of the idea and if he were here he would be able to tell me all about it and explain everything to me But what was his reason for going without breakfast Well it was his father's 
and yet that young man thought he had a soul of his own. He made me very tired and I would like to have quoted Kipling to him. The sins that ye do by two and two, you must answer for one by one. He was a bad case, but when you come to ask men why they do anything, you will be surprised to find how ignorant they are. We mostly do things because our fathers did them. We wear black for mourning because our fathers did. But if we had been born Chinese, we would have worn white, or Persians, we would have worn yellow, or kings, we would have worn purple. And how many of us know why we wear black? Bah! We do it because our fathers did it. And yet I was inclined to sneer at that young Englishman. When we reached Sydney and had settled into our old life, and I was feeling better for the blessed Australian sunshine, I invited a medical friend to come and have lunch with us. When we arrived, it was just one o'clock and I said, The gong has sounded, come along. He replied, I am glad of that, for I am awfully hungry. I have had no breakfast. It gave me a bit of a start. But when I looked at him, I remembered that he also was a crank. He is a good fellow, full of ideals and notions and aspirations for the good of the race, but I used to differ from him terribly. Years and years ago, before I knew him, I gave him a great slating in a Sydney paper, but he has repented of that hearsay for which I wrapped him and has forgiven me, so I love him now. But the no-breakfast theory was a startler all the same. He said that he had been horribly run down and had felt like giving up the ghost when he came across this no-breakfast cure and it had pulled him round and he was now as right as rain. But this doctor was no vegetarian. He ate like the rest of us and acted like the rest of us and was quite rational. But he took no breakfast. He was satisfied with the fact that it had cured him and I was satisfied with the fact that he was still a crank. It gives a man a sense of peace and satisfaction to feel that he is wiser than his neighbors, just as it is said to affect a woman when she thinks that she is wearing the nicest bonnet in church. It fills her soul with a sense of joy such as religion itself cannot give. There is not really much difference between men and women in regard to the basic human nature. We are a John Tamson's Bairns. A few days later, I was talking to a government official, a man in high place, an old friend, and I suggested that he come up home and have lunch with me. He said he took his lunch at half past twelve and he could not wait till one o'clock because he took no breakfast. That fairly took my breath. Another no breakfast crank. And yet, this man was clever, hard-headed, scientific and full of good common sense. When I had expressed my amazement at his fad and otherwise remarked on him, he said, I am well now for the first time in five and twenty years, and it is all owing to the no-breakfast cure. Come and lunch with me tomorrow and I will tell you all about it. And I went and heard his story, which I intend to tell you. It was the first time I had heard the theory fully set out. But I don't think he realized the philosophy of it. No Breakfast or the Secret of Life by Gossip Thomas C. Lothian Chapter 2 The New Gospel When I met my friend for lunch, I expected he was going to take me to a vegetarian restaurant where you get weird messes made up to imitate beef cutlets and steak and kidney pies and bean chops and medicated coffee and things that I loathe. Instead of that, he took me to a first class hotel, a place I knew well. There he ordered a sensible lunch and we fell to. During the meal, he explained what had happened. Now, before I tell you his story, I want you to fully understand that he was a sensible man, a man with a strong mind, a clear eye and a scientific habit. He was a man who weighed evidence and took cognizance of all side issues. He was an author of repute, a well-known thinker and a most reasonable individual. 
I say this first off because I want you to realize that this is not baby talk or cranks talk but real white man's talk. I would give you our conversation in extenso with my skeptical interpolations but it would do no good. I will just go straight along with his story. It may not be so interesting as if broken up with irrelevant remarks but this is a matter of life and death to thousands. It is a new gospel, a higher life, a light in a dark place and I want you all to realize the importance of it. He said, quote, For five and twenty years I have suffered the most terrible tortures from indigestion. Life was one long horrible nightmare and it seemed scarcely worth keeping. I had read all that had been written on the subject almost and tried all sorts of doctors and quacks and remedies. One day about three years ago a friend came to me and asked if I had read Juvia's book on the true science of living. No, I had not and had no intention of reading it. I was full up of quack statements and wanted no more of them. My friend said this book would show me the way to a new life and he pleaded so hard that I promised I would look it over for his sake. I did and before I had read two pages I knew I had found salvation. It was so simple and clear and wonderful that I just grasped the idea in a moment and took hold of the plan and the first day I tried it I was better. Quote, the theory is simple. You go without your breakfast. You come down to two meals a day. You give little Mary a chance. When you go to bed at night, you rest your body, but your stomach has to work for hours after you go to bed, getting rid of the dinner you ate. In the morning, the glands of the stomach are tired and need a rest, but instead of giving them a rest, you pile on a breakfast and set them to work again. And so you keep the internal organs forever at work and you wonder why you have indigestion. Quote, Digestion is a simple chemical process with no evil smells and yet we have ill-smelling people and bad breaths and boils and skin diseases and all sorts of evils. This is due to the fact that their food is not chemically digested as nature meant it to be but is decomposed. And hence come evil smells and evil diseases. If you will take a light dinner and go to bed with but little work for the stomach to do, you will sleep sweetly and soundly and when you wake in the morning, you will be ready for work, ready for life and the world and all its troubles. If you take nothing to eat till lunch time, you will be hungry in your mouth and your stomach will be ready for food. You will enjoy your lunch and you will feel like a man newborn. Quote, you will be told that if a man goes without his breakfast, he will be in danger of a collapse and it is too long to go without food from a light dinner or tea until lunch the next day. I tried it and the first day I was better than I have been for years and now after three years of doing without breakfast, I am better than ever I was in my life. Quote, this American Juvie says that if you are not hungry, you should not eat. If you don't get hungry for a week, don't eat. If you don't get hungry for a month, don't eat. If nature does not call for food, it does you no good to eat. Nature makes no errors. A man says, I have got an awful craving here, a gnawing, a feeling of all goneness. That is cruel. And he lays his hand on his vest buttons, but that is not hunger. That is appetite. A false, delusive, badly trained appetite. When a man is hungry, he is hungry in his mouth and his teeth run water and he has a relish which makes dry bread taste like the food of the gods. When a man is thirsty, he is not thirsty under his waistband. He is thirsty in his mouth, on his tongue. A drop of water to cool his parched tongue is what men are alleged to yearn for in hell. Thirst comes in the mouth, so does hunger. When a man is hungry in his mouth, he won't grumble at simple food and he will need no appetizer. Hunger is the best sauce. Any form of craving for food which comes anywhere less than in the mouth is a delusion and a snare and a liar. Quote, a man will not die of hunger in a day, no, nor a week, nor a month. 
the longer he fasts the clearer his brain grows his brain never starves till the last gasp it feeds on the internal tissues of the man and keeps up till the end a man can be master of his stomach and go about his work for several weeks without a taste of food a friend of mine named b heard this and took it into his head to try it he told his wife he meant to fast for a week and she said he was a foolish man but he was a man with a will so when he came down stairs in the morning he sat at the table and laughed and talked but took no breakfast his wife told him that he was quite well and that if he fasted he might be ill yes he admitted that but he had read juvis book and he meant to fast for a week to see if it was true he went to business as usual but took no lunch he returned to dinner but ate nothing then his wife wept and implored but it was no use he was a man with a way of his own for 7 days that man went in and out from his home in the suburbs to his daily business and took nothing but water it was not a wager nor a piece of bravado it was simply an interesting experiment and at the end of the week he was as fit a man as there was in sydney coat i ought to eat more slowly i confess that is part of juvis teaching but the habits of a lifetime are hard to get over i always did eat quickly and i am not able to go slow now but i know it is wrong if i could take time over my meals it would be better for me but as i tell you a lifetime's habits are against it however i am well now and that is the principal thing and better than that i can eat what i like in the old days i had to pick and choose and leave the very things alone that i liked best because they were indigestible but now bless you i eat whatever i like because i never eat unless i am hungry and twice a day that blessed hunger comes to me puddings and pies and things i have eschewed for a generation all came to me now as a fit food and i enjoy them quote the best of all is however the improvement in my general health not only am i healthier but i am younger and happier my blood circulates joyously and i enjoy living as i never did since my boyhood life has a new meaning to me and i realize that this is a new gospel a gospel of healing for the nation but it is so simple that i fear the masses will be slow in accepting it it is true and i am glad to have heard it and found new life in hearing it unquote such was my friend's story and he strongly advised me to get a juvis book and read it i went home thinking i have not been able to get that book yet but i intend to get it the first chance i mean to read it and when i do i shall tell you all about it but in the meantime i have been converted to the no breakfast cure because shall i tell you why it was the one link that was required for my philosophy i have been practicing philosophy for years practicing juvis philosophy but there was one thing lacking all through the years there has been one link in the chain missing so my physiological philosophy failed to help me or anybody else and i found the link while i was listening to my friend no need for me to get juvis book to convince or convert me the one thing lacking came to me like a pauline illumination i saw as it were the heavens open and there was the simple fact which had been lacking all through the years i could tell you what it was in two words or rather in one hyphenated word but you wouldn't believe it or accept it i say you wouldn't but i mean most of you would decline to accept it but it is as simple as the sermon on the mount i will tell it to you later on but i want to explain to you the simple philosophy of the no breakfast cure and when i have done that i shall tell you the word or words which contain the whole secret perhaps juvie tells it in his book and if he does i shall let you know when i have read it but in the meantime i want you to see the process by which i jumped to the underlying philosophy of my friend's talk and became a convert before i had read the book when i was young i led a wild life as most of you know 
Those who have read The Voyage of Monsoon will realize that the days of my youth were not spent in marble halls nor were my youthful days passed in the lap of luxury. I sailed on all seas and reveled in all forms of wickedness and had my good moments as most men have. When I became a man, I went through some weird religious experiences and went to a great university to pick up an education. It was a trying experience for I had there to learn the depths of my own ignorance and the process hurt, I can assure you. My troubles began early for my stomach gave out and I fell a prey to indigestion. It was not a mild sort either but the savage kind that kills. It was the sort of dyspepsia that fills the world with gloom and makes a man a pessimist. It was hell upon earth and the gloom of those awful days abides with me yet. When my friend was telling me about the no breakfast cure, I was thinking about those old days of horror and the years of woe that followed them. And if I had only had a gleam of sense then, I could have cured myself and cut down my expenses and changed my whole life. You would never have known gossip maybe, but I would have been a great man for it was in me. I knew that then, but what can a man do with a bad stomach? It ruined my college career. It threw me out of my profession and made me a wanderer on the face of the earth. And yet I could have been cured so simply. But not a doctor in the university city could help me. Not a wise man there knew enough to tell me what my friend learned from Dewey's book. So my life was ruined and a good man or the makings of a good man went all to smash. And I have suffered years and years of torture through it since. And when my friend sat there and talked, the illumination came. It all flashed on me as a light from heaven and I was better. As I sit writing here, I count up and it is exactly five weeks today since I gave up my breakfast and I am better than I have been for years. I am better than ever I have been since I went to college and the cure was so simple that I have not even read it yet. It all came through that man's talk. And I want to explain it to you, dear gossips. It is the gospel of life. It is the secret of life itself. It is the beginning of a new era for the decadent world and it is so simple that you need no money to try it. In fact, you will save money and gain health and strength by trying it. I have been looking at the pictures in the Australian medical guide and I wonder why I never saw the thing for myself before. It is all there, but who sees it? Nobody. The beginning of the cure is to go without your breakfast. No Breakfast or The Secret of Life by Gossip Thomas C. Lothian Chapter 3 The Human Machine A good many years ago, Punch gave us a picture which was weirdly philosophical but I don't believe that one in ten thousand saw the point. I saw a point and laughed. But I fancy I laughed at the wrong joke. A lady was speaking to a musical man. Professor, you did not come to my dinner party last night? The professor shrugs his shoulders and replies, Ah, oh, madam, I was not hungry. Whereat I laughed. We laughed, everybody laughed. We thought it was funny of a man to refuse to go to a dinner party because he was not hungry. We are hardly ever hungry when we go to a dinner party. So sure are our hosts of our lack of hunger that they often give us a sherry and bitters or something tasty to whip up our jaded appetites. You don't go to a dinner party because you are hungry. But do you suppose the punch artist wanted us to laugh at that? It would be odd. We ought to laugh at a man who goes to a big dinner and is not hungry. But do we? No fear. We eat when we are not hungry and we stoke the human furnace when there is no need for it and then we wonder why the cry of race degeneration is raising even louder and louder. We wonder why there are so many hospitals and so many drugstores and so many sick. 
and we see men laid up with bilious attacks and we think it is a visitation of God, as if the good God sent bilious attacks. Martin Luther was much more logical when he said, Behold a matter on which there is no room for doubt, and that is that the plague, fevers and other diseases are the work of the devil. And you can see the devil if you get a looking glass. We make our own diseases through our ignorance, and there is only one disease in the world. When I was young, they taught me that there were 67 elements in the world, but they have been greatly added to since. Then along comes the Darwin of physics, who teaches that all the elements are the products of one single indivisible element. I have forgotten the name of it, but no matter. Darwin has taught us that species are not immutable, but that all species have developed from other forms and when you trace life far enough back, you come to a protoplasmic globule or a primordial element or something you don't understand. If you read a quack's advertisement, you will see that his nostrum cures indigestion, dyspepsia, blotches, bad breath, rheumatism, lumbago, piles, consumption, eczema, biliousness and plague. It will cure all diseases. I say that there is only one disease in the world and no drug will cure it you may as well face that fact at once. If twelve of us go and sit on the wet grass for a couple of hours, four of us will have toothache, three of us will have rheumatism, one will have lumbago, two will have piles, one will have gout, and one may escape for the day, but he won't. One day he will get influenza or consumption or typhoid, and he will say he was suddenly attacked. Not a bit of it. Nature has been laying it up for him and is paying him off. Nature never forgets, no, nor forgives. It knows not wrath nor pardon, utter true. It measures meat, its faultless balance weighs, times are as an out, tomorrow it will judge, or after many days. Our diseases were all settled for us by our ancestors for they gave us weak spots and tendencies and all diseases move along the line of least resistance. They fly to the weak spots and so we give them names. But they all come from one cause. The wet grass affected us differently but the ultimate cause was the same. All diseases came from bad blood. No disease can affect a strong man with pure blood. The best germicide in the world is pure blood. A man in good health with bright red, warm, healthy blood could eat consumption germs by the pound and they would do him no harm. His health would kill all the germs that rose up to conquer him. A man with good blood is impervious to disease while a man with poor blood is a center for the malignant microbes to breed in. The man with poor blood gets his favorite disease, whatever it is, consumption or diabetes or liver complaint or the special family affliction, even to madness. We have good authority for saying that the blood is the life. It is. You may swear to that. If you open a vein in a man's arm and let the blood out, you will find the life has gone with it. The blood is the life and the digestive apparatus makes the blood. Therefore, the most important thing about a man is his digestive machine. You need to say that over and say it slowly. The blood is the life and the blood depends on the stomach. We laugh at the silly remark of Josh Billings, but it is gospel truth. Quote, The finest thing any young man can possess is a good, reliable set of bowels. Unquote. All a man is or can be in this world depends on his blood and that depends on his stomach. And very few of us know what a stomach is like or how it works. If a man is going to make the best of himself, he ought to understand himself and his machine. But who does? We have been so educated that we feel it to be almost a sin to see a human body and we are a bit shocked to see a human stomach. And yet, this very stomach is the cause of all our joy or woe, or our success or failure on the earth, and we ignore it. But it refuses to be ignored, 
and so the earth is full of suffering, sickness and needless death. But we are beginning to think and little Mary has come to be recognized. I want to give all my readers a view of what life really is and it will be worth more to them than all the gold of Ind or the priceless jewels of the Orient. A man is a machine or if you prefer the statement a man has a machine and it requires to be cleaned and attended to with great care and it is worth all the care and attention that you can give it. On it depends your whole life. But it is the greatest miracle on earth and is full of strange parts and unaccountable contrivances. If you put your fingers together in the quiet of night, just tip to tip and wait a while, you will feel the driving of the pump. That is what we call the heart pump. It is driving the blood along the arteries and through the veins, doing such wonderful work as you never dreamed of. But I must skip that. It is a miracle of the machine. It requires careful stoking to keep up the heat and that is a science of itself to know what sort of fuel to use. If you let the heat go down and don't stoke the machine and it grows cold, they will say you are dead. So you are. The machine has stopped. Seeing that man depends on this machine, you would think that we would understand it thoroughly. But we don't. Very few people have the slightest idea of the marvelous machine they own and being ignorant they deal with it foolishly and then suffer. The world is full of drugs and hideous things to deal with this poor machine and the hospitals are crowded and a vast number of our little children die every year just because we don't understand the machine. A very clever Russian named Elie Mashinkov, professor at the Pasteur Institute in Paris has written a book called The Nature of Man and I would like to tell you a lot about it but I feel as if life were too short. Yet I must tell you a few things about it to let you see what our machine is. Ellie quotes the Roman Seneca who said long long ago, quote, Take nature as your guide for so reason bids and advises you. To live happily is to live naturally. Unquote. That is good advice. But as we don't know what naturally means, we live artificially and so we are full of sickness. In order to live naturally, we ought to understand our machine and Ellie tells us what it is. This machine of ours is very imperfect and a great German anatomist, Wider Schiem, has shown that there are 15 organs in the human body which are improvements on those in the anthropoid ape. There are 17 organs which still fulfill their duties imperfectly and there are 107 rudimentary organs which serve no useful physiological purpose. One of these useless rudiments is the vermiform appendage which gives us the modern and kingly disease of appendicitis. It does no good and frequently does harm. But our modern surgeons can remove it and the patient recover. The large intestine in the human machine is the seat of a grievous trouble and gives rise to diarrhea, dysentery and all the horrors which sweep the tropics and claim a mighty toll of victims every year. The vast intestine is really of no use to man but was developed among mammals which lived a different life from us. It can be removed surgically and the individual can be none the worse. If we lived on tabloids as some people threaten, the large intestine would have to be removed because it requires bulk to keep it in place. And yet, men talk about changing their diet and their habits as lightly as they talk about changing their clothes. We need to know ourselves as that old adage in the temple at Delphos said, long before Christ. But we have so far forgotten ourselves that the holiest and most sacred parts of the human body have become unholy and unclean. If we are to live happily and die contented, we must learn to live well and in order to do that, we ought to know ourselves and the nature of the machine we own. 
we are to face facts and eli machinkov has many simple facts for us all i want you to consider is this the organic machine we have inside us is not perfect but it is a good one of its kind and each man ought to make the best of it we each start with a good machine but we mostly ruin it of course a few people start out with congenital defects in the machine which nothing can remedy but they are the exceptions most of us start with a good machine i have never forgotten the wise person who said quote i would rather have my boy learn to swear than to eat lollies when he grows up he will discover the folly of swearing and give it up but he can never get a new stomach unquote if a man will only eat when he is hungry he will keep his machine in good order if he never eats until his mouth and stomach call for food his machine will never go back on him it will produce good blood from the food he eats and a man with good blood will feel the life tingling in his veins and will enjoy not only his meals but the singing of birds the color of the sky and the roaring of the wind among the trees life with a good blood is the life of the gay youth extended to a green old age if you never eat except when you are hungry you will never go to late dinner parties and you will never eat for pleasure if you never eat except when you are hungry you will find that you can only eat once or at most twice a day this fashion of having from 3 to 7 meals a day is what is cursing the race if you stand at the corner of a busy street and watch the faces you will be appalled to see how few really healthy people there are nearly everybody has something or other the matter with them and yet there is only one cause for disease and that is bad blood every disease under heaven comes from bad blood and it is bad because we laugh at the wrong idea in punch we laugh at the man who refused to go to a dinner party because he was not hungry because we eat in response to a false appetite instead of hunger we are sick unto death the stomach is the source of the blood and the blood is the life no breakfast or the secret of life by gossip thomas c lothian chapter 4 how it works one day recently just after i had discovered the secret a man from the nevo nevo was sitting in my office yarning and the talk drifted on to health he had been a strong healthy man all his life until within the last year or two now he was suffering from his eyes and was a good deal affected with rheumatism the latter had attacked him after a spell of a flood up in the northwest he failed to understand why he a healthy good living strong man should be suffering like this i could since i had heard this juvious theory i was quite satisfied about it i knew why he was ill and why everybody is ill I had learned the secret and it was so plain that I wondered why anybody failed to understand it. Why don't I tell it to you in two words? It wouldn't be of the slightest use. You would simply laugh at me. You wouldn't believe that the secret is so simple. There is no secret about it at all. It is in the New Testament and in all the Bibles of the world. Men have been teaching it for ages. I must tell you what my old friend Epictetus said about it and I want to tell you first about the man from the Nevo Nevo. I said to him, "You are sick because you eat too much." He laughed sadly and replied, "That is just where you are wrong. I can't eat at all. I can only pick like a bird. I used to be able to eat a good meal, but now my appetite has gone entirely. That is my trouble." Yes, that was his trouble, and I knew it. The secret had taught me that, and this was my first experience since I had learned it. And what a simple thing it was to explain. 
I said that a good engineer ought to get the most work out of the machine with the smallest possible amount of fuel, but some people kept stoking the furnace all day long for pleasure. Yes, he agreed that most of us ate too much and we ate for pleasure instead of for sustenance. But that was not his case. He used to eat good meals and enjoy them and come in starving, but now he hardly ate anything. I said, now let us see what do you eat? There is seven o'clock tea in the morning, isn't there? He smiled as he replied, yes, we bush people are fond of tea and I would rather go without my breakfast than my early tea. But mind you, I don't eat much with it. Just a little bit of bread and butter or sometimes a biscuit. Just a mouthful to take the edge off things. Yes, that was all right. Just a cup of tea and a mouthful of food at seven o'clock in the morning before getting out of bed. That could do no harm? Certainly not. Why? What harm could a cup of tea and a biscuit do to a strong man? Then there is nine o'clock breakfast? Well, there used to be. At least it was at half past eight and I looked on breakfast as the best meal in the day. I was always ready for it and sometimes I had done half a day's work before that in the busy times like shearing and lamb marking or mustering for home bush. Yes, there was a breakfast at 8.30. There was porridge and plenty of milk. A nice chop and potatoes and sometimes a couple of eggs. Yes, breakfast used to be a good meal, but of late it had been a frost, for he ate very little. Then there was eleven o'clock tea in the forenoon? Oh yes, but that was just a bite and a sup. If they were away from the homestead, nobody bothered about that. Still, it was nice and refreshing and it was always there if you wanted it and he always had it in town. He added, you see, I am nearly a teetotaler and hardly ever touch hard stuff and I always take fellows in for tea instead of whiskey. As if whiskey were the worst thing in the world. For every 10 killed by whiskey, there are 10,000 killed by food. Eating kills thousands where drinking only kills tens or units. Yes, there was 11 o'clock tea. And then there was 1 o'clock lunch? Yes, that was a good meal. Everybody was ready for lunch. It was the meal of the day with some, but my friend had not been able to enjoy his lunch for a long time now. Somehow, since his eyes had been bad and he had been troubled with rheumatism, his appetite had gone all to pieces. Well now, let us see. There is afternoon tea, isn't there? Why? Yes. Everybody mustered up for that. No custom had ever taken such a hold of the British race as it. People set out tea now instead of whiskey. The bad old customs were dying out and the new ones were better and wiser and made men nicer. Hmm, yes. In the olden days, the Hawkesbury natives got no afternoon tea, nor forenoon tea, nor early morning tea. No, nor lunch. And yet they were fine men, a fine race. They drank a deal of bad whiskey too and had rough times. And yet they were finer men than the ones who get afternoon tea. Well, yes, but the tea had nothing to do with that. All right, we will admit that for the sake of argument. But it is odd, isn't it? There is dinner at six, for which you dress, if there is anybody to meet you. The wife is nobody. A man never dresses for his wife. But if another man's wife is coming to dinner, he puts on a nice suit of clothes. That is a big mistake. A man and woman should never forget the courting days. They should never grow commonplace to each other. But that has nothing to do with this question. It comes in just by accident, as it were. There is a good square meal at six o'clock and a cup of coffee in the drawing room afterwards. Or else, if some other men are there, there is a drop of the real Mackay and a smoke. Yes, that is about it. Then about 10 or 11, just before turning in, there is a mouthful of supper, a bit of bread and beef, or bread and cheese 
and a drop of something comforting? Yes, it used to be that before my eyes went wrong. But still nobody ate much for supper. It was only a sort of stop gap to keep the devil out of your stomach at night. It was not really a meal by any stretch of imagination. No, certainly not. Now let us see where we have got to. There is morning tea 1, breakfast 2, 11 o'clock tea 3, lunch 4, afternoon tea 5, dinner 6 and supper 7. 7 meals a day in thousands of homes in Australia and then we wonder why we have bad eyes and rheumatism. A man must have a marvelous machine to stand that. A man can eat as much in one hour as he can digest in 24 hours. If a man only ate once a day, he would never have bad eyes or rheumatism or anything else in the way of disease. He would have pure blood and a clear brain and a bright eye and an active liver. His machinery would work like a charm and the world would be full of glory and beauty and he would enjoy life instead of enduring it. Most of the Australian pessimism comes from the ignorance of the primal physiological laws of nature. Not one man in 10,000 knows how to eat, what to eat or when to eat. Apollo's apothegm, man know thyself, has been absolutely forgotten and it has become rude and vulgar to know yourself. And so the streets are full of wasters, mental and physical, and we are crowded with drug stores, doctors and quacks. One day, soon after I had enjoyed the talk with the man from the Never Never, I went out to visit an artist friend, and his wife, on hospitable thoughts intent, started to get afternoon tea for me. I had not long to stop, and it was a bit early. But I must have it, of course, because I had come a long way out on the train. But I didn't take afternoon tea. No, honest, I really did not. Well, I must have a drop of whiskey. No, I didn't take that either. They were staggered. Our idea of enjoyment is eating and drinking, and if a man will neither eat with you nor drink with you, beware of him. We are such brutal savages, such crude, unthinking barbarians that we hold it to be the height of hospitality to make a man eat and drink even when he doesn't want it. If a man were to refuse afternoon tea by saying, I am not hungry, people would be shocked at him. You know it is so. I would not eat nor drink, so out of my respect for my hostess, a most charming lady, I had to explain that I had come down to two meals a day. It had cured my rheumatic gout. It had cured my weak eyes and I was better than I had been for the last five years. But two meals a day? I would surely die. Two meals a day? No breakfast? No. No supper? No. Nothing at all between a light dinner and lunch the next day? No. It was awful. They were shocked. Then I told my hostess about the man from the Never Never who had bad eyes and rheumatism, and as I recounted the number of meals he had, she exclaimed, Don't talk like that. I have all those things. Suddenly her daughter, a most intelligent girl, who had taken little or no part in the conversation, chipped in with a laughing remark. She said, Yes, mother, and you have got bad eyes and rheumatism. It never fails. You may take my word for it. Gossips. The blood is the life and the blood comes from digestion and you cannot get the machine to make good blood unless you stoke the furnace rightly. Your stomach is the seat of your life. It lies behind all your thinking and your doing. It is the source of all your energy and intellect. It is your very soul. It is you. As a man is in his stomach, so is he in his life. If he is a gross feeder, he is a gross man. A man is what his stomach makes him all the time. Bad eyes and rheumatism come from bad blood, as sure as daylight comes from the sun. Disease comes from the stomach all the time. Men eat for pleasure and they suffer pain. Men eat when they are not hungry and the stomach rebels and they get disease. 
think it out for yourselves. No Breakfast or The Secret of Life by Gossip Thomas C. Lothian Chapter 5 About Women In looking for that book of Dr. Dewey's The True Science of Living, I came across another one of his called A New Era for Women. I read it with the greatest avidity and it told me much of what I had learned from a friend. But by the time I found that book, I felt I had been converted to the higher life and had an experience of my own to draw upon. I had been breakfastless for some weeks and was enjoying life as I had not done for years. And I had grasped the secret which underlay the no breakfast theory and it is so simple that it is incomprehensible and so easy that it is almost impossible. I will tell you about that later. The real book of Dewey's I have not been able to procure yet, but the book about women was a revelation. I would like to copy out whole chapters of it and let you read them for yourselves, but it is no use doing that unless I reproduce the book entirely. But I must give you some quotations from my notes after I have told you some other things. The lives of millions of Christian women are lives of miserable slavery. They are kept to the cookstove and the wash-up place and all the sordid slavery of the domestic altar from childhood up. They have no time to study or think or realize what they are or why they are or anything else. The poor souls find refuge in Mary Corelli and frocks and ribbons and gee-gaws and they become mere dolls, toys or household drudges. The woman who gets her eyes opened and sees life as it really is can only wring her hands in hopeless impotence. We men have cursed women through our ignorant selfishness and curses come home to roost every time. The race is degenerating and no wonder. Here is a fact which come home to me with the crushing force of a seniatic revelation. I told you in the last chapter about the man who had seven meals or millets in one day. Each one meant the washing up of so many plates, cups, saucers, dishes, knives, forks, etc. Did you men ever try the washing up business? We were short of a servant years ago and my wife and I are chums so I said I would share the household work. I could peel potatoes and do all sorts of handy things for I lived the life when I was young. I had a pleasure in getting the dinner ready but when it came to washing up it led to my breaking up. It seemed a fool idea to be always washing up. I am fairly clean man, I hope, but I began to think about buying dishes and pans that would wash themselves. Aha! The pans and dishes are the leg irons of the women. They are the fetters that bind them to the domestic altar and crush their lives and minds and souls. If a man has one meal a day for a year, he has 365 meals in a year. That is right. I am no mathematician and my ignorance of the multiplication table is a titanic. But I know that much. If a man has three meals a day, he has 1095 meals in a year. If he has seven millets a day, he takes 2555 in a year. And if there are ten in a family, you have to multiply that by ten. That is, in a family of ten, run on that horrible basis which is so common in our country, you have 25,550 meals every year. And then we wonder why women are sick and ill and weary. And we wonder why we have a servant question. I wonder how it is that we men dare to look ourselves straight in the face? When you come to think about it, we have enslaved the women to a far greater extent than any nation of savages ever did. And yet we pretend that we are such gallant cavaliers and we bob our hats to other men's wives and daughters and pretend that we reverence the sex. We are a race of nigger drivers. Men go on strike for eight hours a day and a fair wage and small blame to them. But women would never dream of an eight hours a day. Their work is never done. 
remember the bitter pathos of the old woman's epitaph. Here lies an old woman who was always tired, for she lived in a house where no help was hired. And her last words on earth were, Dear friends, I am going where no washing is done, nor churning, nor shoeing, where all things will be just exact to my wishes, for where there is no eating, there is no washing of dishes. I will be where loud anthems forever are ringing, but having no voice, I will get quit of the singing. Don't mourn for me now and mourn for me never, for I am going to do nothing forever and ever. There are millions of women in Christian lands today who dream of happiness, eternal happiness, as a time of leisure, as a time when they shall rest from the lifelong slavery which men have imposed upon them. The Greeks and Romans had one or at most two meals a day and they were fine men physically. Our savage ancestors had one meal a day when they were in luck. We have so complicated life and so wandered away from the primal simplicity of the race that we have come to three meals a day as a minimum and thousands have seven. And in spite of all the advances of science, in spite of servers and baths and pills and waters and medicine of every kind, we are a race of wasters. There are very few really healthy people among us. A healthy, hearty old man or woman is a rarity. Our streets are full of chemists shops and doctors and mighty hospitals. And millions of people, especially women, are dragging out a miserable existence. The pessimism of our race is terrible and no wonder. The source of our life is polluted, our blood is impure by overeating, and our women are slaves of our worship of little Mary. You can hear men talking rapturously about the good dinners and the fine cooks and the excellent wines they enjoy. Yes, we have fine dinners for charity, we have teas and luncheons and suppers without end. Life is eating and drinking and dressing. And then we wonder why so many are sick, why so many are ill. We wonder why so many children die and why there is so much suffering in the world. We make it ourselves by our brutal ignorance. The good God never sends sorrow or suffering to any. It is all our own doing. But I have not told you about Dewey. He affirms and I reaffirm it that health comes without thought or cost or worry. You have nothing to do but leave things alone. Don't eat because the bell rings or the clock strikes. Don't eat because it is breakfast time or dinner time. Never eat until you are hungry. Return to the methods of the savage if you will, but don't eat for pleasure. If you do, you will live for pain. Perfect health he describes as the physiological balance between destruction and construction that goes on ceaselessly in cell life. That means that when the cells call for construction, you are hungry. If you feed them when they are not hungry, they will strike and you will suffer from disease without a hyphen. You will be ill. This man, Dr. Dewey, says there is no frowning providence behind the clouds. You are your own providence. He says that the first step to disease is the loss of digestive power and that whatever lowers digestive power is the first exciting cause of disease. And it is. When a man gorges his stomach, he is going to suffer. He may eat rich foods and drink sweet wines and smoke strong cigars and be none the worse for it as far as he can see, but he will suffer as sure as death. The mills of God grind slowly, but they grind exceeding small. It may be that your internal machine is so good that you can do foolish things with impunity for a long time, but the reckoning day comes. You cannot escape fate, law, God. Every morsel of food beyond the power of digestion and assimilation is the direct cause of disease. All disease comes from the stomach. Good blood kills disease. You cannot give a man disease if his blood is pure. 
but that morsel of undigested food in his stomach sets up putrefaction and blood is ready for disease what form that disease will take was settled for you by your ancestors it may be diabetes or consumption lumbago or skin disease rheumatism bad eyes or asthma but you get a disease and it comes from the blood all diseases move along the line of least resistance and perfect digestion means perfect health if your digestive machine is right no harm can come to you by day or night pure blood means perfect health good digestion means good blood now look at this from the women's side of the question your frequent meals are killing you as well as your women folk your frequent meals make the servant trouble and your wife or your mother has to do the work or the worry the departure from the simple system of life is leading you into the slavery of death and destruction and the only way for a man to save his own soul is to give up eating except when he is hungry and he will never be hungry more than once or at most twice a day he will save his own soul reduce the household worries over 50% and so save his wife and his women folk the best way to begin this salvation process is to drop having breakfast but as soon as ever you mention that you are met by the argument that if you go out on an empty stomach you will catch all sorts of diseases I used to think so myself so it is no use me throwing stones at people who still stick to my old religion the answer to that is that it is not true you won't catch diseases but you will catch health the other day we were up the blue mountains and when we were leaving we came by the 8:30 train in the morning when our hostess found that we were going to make the two and a half hours journey without breakfast she was sorely troubled it was bad enough to go without it while staying in the house but to travel no never it was impossible i realize how dreadful it seems but christianity was quite as shocking to the roman pagans all new religions are like that Our hostess was so troubled about us that I had to wire and tell her we reached home in safety and enjoyed our lunch ever so much. When a man has a late dinner as most of us have I suppose and then a bite of supper he goes to bed with a full stomach for it is a very small bag after all 10 inches from side to side 4 inches from top to bottom and 4 inches from back to front. he goes to sleep and rests his body but his internal machine is going all night long no wonder men have unhappy dreams when he awakes in the morning he has an appetite for he realizes that nature is tired from the all night efforts to get rid of the food he has an appetite for his breakfast but it is only an appetite a desire a craving it is not hunger breakfast is not a natural meal it is the product of a false delusive appetite all the glands of the stomach and the mouth are weary the man has no saliva to begin the process of digestion with his stomach is as tired as his mouth but he has an appetite for his breakfast if he lacks an appetite he takes a drop of something to give him one but he is not hungry hunger comes in the mouth Hunger is not a craving or a sinking or a gnawing nor an all goneness no fear hunger is hunger and it comes in the mouth if a man has the courage to put this to the test and say i won't eat till i am hungry he will save his household from slavery and his own soul from death a man who undertakes to eat when he is hungry only will soon find that two meals a day are ample A fair lunch in the middle of the day and a very light dinner at night is plenty or better still a tea then his household will be healthy and happy and his own life will be free from disease he will see the sun shining as it never shone before and life will tingle through all his veins as it never did since his careless boyhood 
and his women folk will have time to look around and wonder at the glory of God's fair earth. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. No Breakfast or The Secret of Life by Gossip Thomas C. Lothian Chapter 6 Life's Little Tragedies Many a time I have written you about life's little tragedies, the little, daily, hourly, oft-recurring sorrows of this pathetic little life struggle of ours. Since I have learned the secret of life, mine eyes have been opened in a wonderful manner to the sight of many of the preventable tragedies of existence. I have held as a truth for many years that the kingdom of God is within you, but it is only recently that I have realized how deep and awful is the significance of the phrase. It means that we make our own sorrows. It means that we make our own illnesses. It means that all the suffering and woe and hunger and despair on the earth are made by man. It is a terrible statement, but I believe it to be true. While in England recently, we met a man and his wife who was staying in the same house. They seemed a loving, nice couple and always went out together and enjoyed the sights of the town in the company of one another. They had one child, a little girl of four, with the saddest face you ever saw. She was a nice child, in a way, but seemed to be always on the verge of crying. The man and woman loved one another, and the child was their idol. They did all that fond parents could do to make it happy. It had no end of toys and books and expensive playthings, but the child took little interest in them all. She seemed lonesome and unhappy, and the parents fretted and worried over the small child till they all appeared miserable together. And yet they were fond of one another. You never heard an angry word among them. They were unselfish and tender and very intelligent, but they were not happy. They sat at the same table as we did, and I noticed that he ate a terrible quantity of food. He was quick over it too, and I used to feel as though I were a glutton. He came to the table after me as a rule and left before me, and yet I did not eat more than a quarter of what he ate. But then he was a big, tall, spare, bad-colored man. He looked as if he had spent most of his life in India. What was my surprise to learn that he had never been out of England? I have been teaching for years past that it is not what a man eats that makes him fat, but what he assimilates. There are very stout people who eat little, and there are very thin people who eat a great deal. And I know that their physical characteristics were the result of heredity. That was all right too, in a way, but it was only when the Sydney man told me his story that the deeper, holier, higher, wider, everlasting truth dawned upon me. Then I realized the bitterness of the English tragedy of which I had been a witness. The man took suddenly ill. His wife said he got a chill coming from the theatre one night because he had on a thin suit and the wind had turned to the east while the play was going on. But he would soon be better. He had been ailing more or less all his life. He was a subject to attacks of this sort and it would soon pass over. But it did not pass over. The poor man grew worse and worse and his temperature rose to abnormal heights and the doctor was called in and the devoted wife became the nurse. She sat up day and night and waited on her husband as only a devoted wife can. The man had to be fed every two hours with liquid food to keep his strength up. And so that poor woman was on the move day and night for a while. But nature has her limits and very soon a hired nurse had to be secured and the wife and the nurse spent their days and nights beside the sick man's bed. The little girl came to the table as of old for all meals and my sympathies went out to the helpless babe. But we could do nothing for her. She would sit up to the table for lunch and eat nothing. She would rattle on the plates with her knife and fork and pick up food with her fingers. She would upset cups, tumblers, anything that came in her way. 
but she hardly ever ate anything. She had never been taught how to behave at the table because she was too young, poor little soul. A baby's education should start before it can see or hear or creep. The wise parent begins the child's education before it is born, but that is another subject. This little child was a source of sore trouble to us all, but what could we do? Our sympathies were with the mother and father in their visitation and we could only express it by bearing with the little girl. If I had thought of the theory at all, I would have realized what was the matter with the father, the mother and the child because my own common sense and physiological knowledge ought to have taught me. But it didn't. I had never heard of Dr. Dewey and I was ill myself from the very same cause that was cursing this unfortunate family. We find it difficult to think behind and beyond the customs of our race. We wear black clothes for mourning and think it a religious custom. It never dawns on us that our ancestors used to disguise themselves with mud and blood and gashings so that the evil spirit of the dead would not recognize them and take them away. No, certainly not. We never dare even if we were able to ask for the beginning of things or the origin of customs. The little girl at our table could not eat her meals because her ignorant, foolish, loving mother allowed her to eat sweets and cakes at all hours. When the child cried because of indigestion, her mother gave her a beautiful sweet cake. When the child was fretting because her stomach was out of order, the mother gave her sweet meats and delicate little dainties such as confectioners make. And when the mother had to give the child castor oil, she bribed the babe with eatables. And so the little victim of a mother's foolish love worried us all at the table and kept the house in a ferment. And the father was suffering from exactly the same thing. He had allowed his stomach to be his master and had never been real hungry in his life. He had eaten to satisfy his appetite and the more he ate, the more appetite he had. It is like a man drinking whiskey to quench his thirst. The more he drinks, the thirstier he gets until all the whiskey in the earth would fail to quench his thirst. He drinks and drinks till the blue devils dance around him and the fires of hell consume him and his thirst burns him up. The appetite is exactly the same as the drinkatite. The more you eat, the more you want to eat, and the more you eat, the harder you are to please, and finally, your internal machinery gets out of order. Nature goes on strike, and you get pneumonia, or pleurisy, or rheumatic gout, or dysentery, or deafness, or blindness, or some horrible disease. This poor man had an attack of pneumonia, but it was really a case of poisoning from overeating. If the doctors had been wise, they would have said, let his body fight it out with the disease, but don't worry his stomach till nature has had a chance. Don't give him bite or sup till he is hungry if it takes six weeks. Instead of that, they ordered the poor man to be fed every two hours. And although his stomach recoiled from food, yet he had been brought up in the bad old tradition of his race. His strength must be kept up as if the poor weak body could digest the foods that were given him. The milk and beef tea and horrible things that his stomach would have recoiled from in health were forced on him in sickness and so the poor man died. He died from his own ignorance, from his parents' ignorance probably, from the doctor's ignorance, from his wife's ignorance. And yet at the funeral the minister read the words, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. And nobody said it was a lie. Nobody said it was a libel on the good God. The man had committed suicide through ignorance and the ignorant ones had helped him. The widow would have laid herself down in the grave with her darling and died there contentedly, but her little girl called her. The child was sick now and the mother said that it was through being neglected while her husband was ill. If that child had been so neglected that it had cried from hunger, she might have lived to be an old woman. 
if the neglect had meant starvation that child would have grown healthy but the same disease that killed the father killed the child it died from race suicide from race ignorance from overfeeding that child never was hungry in its life it never enjoyed one rational meal in all its little career the poor child was fed to death through the ignorance of its loving parents the babe died and was buried and the widow was left to wail over the mysterious decrees of providence no child on earth should be fed more than 3 times a day and no man or woman should be fed more than twice a day the human stomach is a bag with a capacity of say 2 pints and it ought to be absolutely cleaned out every day and given a chance to recover itself rest itself after the burden of its work but who gives it a chance how many men or women ever allow themselves to get hungry except by accident if a man is going to the war he keeps his rifle clean and in good order he knows his officers know everybody knows that his life may depend on it so it is part of his daily drill to learn to handle his rifle and to keep it clean a man's stomach is of much more importance to him in the battle of life than was ever rifle to soldier but who teaches him how to use it who teaches him how to keep it clean and in good order nobody so far have we forgotten the simple laws of life that we don't even know that we have got stomachs we have a saying that no man can be perfectly happy if he knows he has a stomach and millions of us endorse that statement in the most practical manner we are so sunk in ignorance that when a popular dramatist called the stomach little mary we all adopted the phrase gladly so that we might refer to the organ on which our material and eternal welfare is based we have so complicated life that we eat when the bell rings and we keep the stomach in constant work even to the extent of seven meals a day then we wonder why disease is rife when influenza comes or any new disease we look on it as a visitation of god but it is not it is nature's protest against our sinful ignorance the tragedy we saw in england of which i have told you in this chapter is only one out of thousands that occur yearly in our own land we are blind and ignorant and almost hopeless and what can we do we can do nothing but you can do much you the individual can do everything the remedy for all the sins against the body is to take your own self in hand and never eat till you are hungry it is so simple so easy so effective it is like the teachings of jesus christ love your neighbor but it takes a deal of self control to practice it no breakfast or the secret of life by gossip thomas c lothian chapter 7 biliousness a friend of mine suffers from biliousness and when the attacks come and they come more frequently as he grows older he suffers the most frightful agony his eyes turn yellow his skin grows sallow and all the energy of life goes out of him business is impossible for the pains of hell get hold upon him and he goes to bed and moans in agony he is a clever man too an exceedingly clear sighted shrewd businessman but he suffers horribly from biliousness since i learned the secret of life i have been well better than i have been for years and years i am growing younger too and i run up stairs taking two steps at a time the other day i came out of my office and one of the staff who has been with me for about 8 years smilingly said i never knew you could whistle i wondered where the joke came in but it appeared that i had actually been whistling in the office just from the pure joy of living it is years and years since i was as well as i am now One day I was going over to see this bilious friend of mine and I suddenly stopped in the middle of Pitt Street near the post office and said, "Is that you?" "Me?" 
I? Yes. Here was I swinging along like a boy with my heart full of gladness and my veins full of joyous life. Was this the man who had been mopping for years and seeking health in France and the south of England and America and on the wide salt seas of a sad world? The very same man. And I had come back to dear old Sydney to the sunshine and the friends and the comfort. And here I was riotously well and happy. And why? Because I had suddenly found the secret of life and one half of it is never eat till you are hungry. Most of you know the other half as well and it is almost as simple and as silly as the first half. But it would be useless to tell you what it is now. I will leave that till later. When I reached my friend's office, he looked the picture of misery, for he had been suffering from one of his bilious attacks and ought to have been at home. He had been in bed all yesterday, but he had felt compelled to come to business today or things would have gone all wrong. There you have the whole thing. He was a slave to his business. His business had him by the leg more securely than ever the leg irons had a lag. We are nearly all slaves to business or habit or social custom or appetite or disease of some sort. The only free man is he who is master of himself and enjoys life from hour to hour or as Horace puts it, Lord of himself that man will be and happy in his life alway, who still at eve can say with the free contented soul, I have lived today. How many of us live today? Are we not waiting till we have made our fortunes? Are we not putting off living till there shall be less worry or more money or easier times? I, Mary, my gossips, we think we shall live by and by, but if we fail to live today, we have lost a day of life. The kingdom of God is within you, said the Master, and it is in you today as much as it will ever be. My friend was a wise man, as this world counts wisdom. He was a shrewd businessman indeed, a man with many servants. And I dare say some of his employees thought him a hard taskmaster. But none of his men worked as hard as he did himself. He dared not be so hard on a hired man as he was on himself. And so he suffered. He had bilious attacks. I told him how to cure them, but he smiled. Ah, yes, it was nice of me. But his disease lay too deep to be cured by simply fasting. Then I remembered the story of the leper Naaman, who went to Elisha and the prophet told him to wash seven times in the Jordan and he would be healed. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and strike his hand over the place, and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Parpar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them, and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. My friend did not get into a rage, but he smiled at the simplicity of my remedy and said in his heart what Naaman the leper said. Human nature never alters in its depths. We only change superficially. In the abysmal depths of the human heart, where the storms of the hour come not, we are as of old. David and Solomon, Naaman and Elisha are with us today. Men may come and nations go, but the heart abideth forever. My friend, the modern Naaman, objected to the simple cure of hunger just as the ancient Naaman objected to the simple bath in the poor little Jordan. But he is getting converted and I hope that before these words are in print, his bilious attacks will be over. After I left him, I wondered how I had been so long blind to the simple cure for biliousness. Had nobody ever told me the cause of it? I looked up the Australian Medical Guide, Volume 1, page 91, under the head of bilious and that tells you what it is. The doctor says that our semi-tropical climate is a good cause, but he adds, quote, 
Other frequent causes are errors in eating and drinking, constipation, sedentary occupations or indolent habits and want of a sufficient or proper exercise. Quote, it is often the result of some indiscretion in diet. Sick headache, as it is called, is for the most part a form of acute indigestion. It is best to keep the digestive organs quiet after the attack is over. Accordingly, no solid food should be allowed for a day or two and the diet restricted to liquid or semi-liquid nourishment. Unquote. In cases of subacute biliousness, page 92, the doctor says, Quote, in this form, there has been perhaps the unstinted use of unsuitable food with possibly, in addition, more alcoholic liquor than is desirable or necessary. Unquote. When I read the medical guide in the light of recent knowledge, I saw that it had explained to me that the root and source of all biliousness is the stomach. But why had I not learned it? It is simple. It is as simple as the Sermon on the Mount which says, in effect, Love your neighbor. All the law and the gospel is summed up in those three words and if every man loved his neighbor, there would be no war, no strife, no hatred, malice or uncharitableness and the kingdom of heaven would exist on the earth. You see that? It is as simple as ABC. But why don't we do it? Well, it is not easy, is it? Going to church on Sunday is a heap easier. But why don't we do the simple thing? Why did Naaman fly into a rage at being told to wash in the Jordan? Because it was too simple. Why did not my bilious friend adopt my cure? Because he was a Naamitish. If a man will only eat when he is hungry, he will never be bilious. If a man will chew his food well before he swallows it, he will never be ill. You need to say that over and over again and say it slowly. You need to realize that a man is a machine, a delicate, complicated, wonderfully adaptive machine which has taken thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years to bring to what it is today. But very few people appear to realize that. The legend on the temple of Delphos has been forgotten. Man, know thyself. We have forgotten what manner of animal we are. Hence the race for wealth and place and power and the deterioration of the race which is going on with the advance in material prosperity. But the new gospel has been sounded and the evangel of the higher, simpler life is calling over land and sea. This secret of life embodies the teaching of the new world's gospel and it is bound to spread because it is true. But it is repulsive to many because it is simple and because it means self-control, self-denial and the development of the higher, holier man. And yet it is bound to spread and spread rapidly and you hear rumors of it on every side. You see paragraphs about it in the papers. Here is what I read only this morning in the daily paper. Quote, eating too much and too often. Quote, in one of Byrno's comedies, an old family doctor tersely sums up the ills of one of his female patients in this way. She eats too much and too often. A brief but valuable sermon on this universally interesting subject has been preached by the Hygienic Gazette of London as follows. Quote, A prolific cause of chronic indigestion is eating from habit and simply because it is mealtime and others are eating. To eat when not hungry is to eat without relish and food taken without relish is worse than wasted. Without relish, the salivary glands do not act, the gastric fluids are not freely secreted and the best of foods will not be digested. Many perfectly harmless dishes are severely condemned for no other reason than that they were eaten perfunctorily and without relish and due in salivation. Hunger makes the plainest foods enjoyable. It causes vigorous secretion and outpouring of all the digestive fluids 
the sources of thialin, pepsin, trypsin, etc., without a plentiful supply of which no foods can be perfectly digested. Wait for an appetite if it takes a week. Fasting is one of the saving graces. It has a spiritual significance only through its great physical and physiologic importance. If breakfast is a bore or lunch a matter of indifference, cut one or both of them out. Wait for distinct and unmistakable hunger and then eat slowly. If you do this, you need ask a few questions as to the property and digestibility of what you eat, and it need not be pre-digested. Unquote. That is the summing up of the new gospel in a clear, terse manner. But who will heed it? Very few. I must tell you the rest of the secret later on. No Breakfast or The Secret of Life by Gossip Thomas C. Lothian Chapter 8 A Matter of Taste Suppose I were to say now that I was going to tell you a wonderful secret, one that would lengthen your lives and bring joy and peace into dreary existences, wouldn't you be excited? Well, that is what I am going to do, but you won't believe it. And yet, some of you dear folks will catch a glimpse of the passing glory and will realize what the secret of life is and you will live happy ever after like the lovers in the fairy tale. And why not all of you? Yes, why not? The trouble with most of us is mental laziness. We are slow at thinking. We are not used to it and it hurts. We have been brought up to believe that it is wicked to think for ourselves and so we have mostly forgotten how and we live in ruts and grooves and dark valleys where the blessed sunshine cometh never. I know how you can heal all your evil diseases, all your sicknesses and languors and depressions and blues and pessimisms. And it is cheap. The cure is in your hands. You have not got to buy any expensive books or electrical belts or medicines. It is cheap as the gospel of God and as free as the air you breathe and because it is so cheap and simple, many of you won't believe it. But I am not discouraged. Some will hear and heed. Now listen to me and believe me if you can. All disease is the result of sin. Sin is a breach of the law. Nature's idea of sin and man's idea of sin are two different things. The old saying is that evil is wrought by want of thought as well as want of heart. The things you do thoughtlessly are sins as well as the things you do maliciously. Nature punishes a man for the things he did without thinking just as mercilessly as she does for the things he did willfully and deliberately. Sin is not what we mostly think it is. All disease is the result of ignorance. You see that, don't you? If a man puts some dynamite into the fire to see what will happen, he gets blown to pieces. But he is punished for the ignorance just the same as if it was a sin. Men sin through ignorance and it is counted to them as a sin. And the punishment of sin is disease, lack of ease, pain and sorrow. Just look at the average man eating and you will find that he bolts his food with very little mastication. Very few of us have time to eat properly. We are in such a hurry to live that we have no time to live right. We are so hurried in our existence that we fail to get the pleasure out of it. And we say that life is a failure. So it is to most of us, but that is our own fault. Let me repeat what you ought to clearly understand before this. A man's life depends upon his blood. The blood is the life. The blood is produced by the stomach, so a man's life depends on his stomach. Therefore, the most essential thing for a man to do is to look out for his stomach. Yes, that is right. But he ought to understand it. But who does? A man ought to eat for strength, but some eat for pleasure. 
sum it for necessity and take as little time over it as possible. Then they wonder why they are ill. A man should never eat till he is hungry and that will never be more frequently than once or at most twice in the 24 hours. When he does eat, he should see that his food is nutritious and that he gets all the nutriment out of it in his mouth. But who does that? Men swallow soup as they swallow water or whiskey or temperance drinks. They hardly ever get the taste of it. They bolt their food without ever waiting to taste it. They never think of the holy sense of taste. They wonder why they are ill, why they have horrible diseases and rheumatism and gout and Bright's disease and consumption and diabetes and bilious attacks and a thousand other things. It is because they never taste their food. A man has a wonderful machine inside of him, a very miracle of mechanism, a living organic machine. It is more delicate and complicated than the Strasbourg clock. It is more miraculous than the story of Jonah and the whale. It is so wonderful that the human mind falters at thought of it. When the bishop saw a man opened, he said, I wonder how we live. So do I. It is a miracle. To keep this machine in good going order, a man ought to see that the fuel is right. He should burn good coal and see that no unnecessary work is put on to the machine. In order to do that, he should never eat till his teeth are watering, till the glands of his mouth are all in active operation with the desire for food. That is the first process in the manufacture of good blood. If a man eats when he is not hungry, he is tempting fate to smite him and fate does it too. There is no paltering with the gods. They never err nor falter. They strike always. The sins of the fathers are visited on the third and fourth generations, it may be, but the blow falls every time. When a man's teeth are watering, he ought to eat and not before. Then he ought to be sure that no food passes down into that wonderful machine until he has reduced it all to pulp, to a fine fluent pulp, out of which he has extracted all the taste, all the nutrition. The best taste of a mouthful of food comes at the very last. When there is no taste in a thing, there is no nutrition in it. You get the taste by chewing it and when you chew something in vain till all the taste has gone out of it and it is not reduced to a pulp, eject it. That morsel is not fit for the machine. All the fuel for the machine should be properly reduced to a pulp so that you require no liquid with your meals. If you have to wash your dinner down with beer or tea or water or any fluid, you will have to pay for it later with influenza or indigestion or some dreadful disease. You never, never can escape. The eyes of the gods are everywhere. Old Epictetus, the Roman slave, my friend and teacher, said in the days of Nero, quote, we have a body in common with the brutes and reason and sentiments in common with the gods. Most people incline towards their unhappy and mortal kindred and only some few to the happy and divine one. Unquote. Amen. Very few of us realize our godlike relationships and we eat and drink as do the beasts. And then we wonder why we are ill? The wonder is that we are ever well. Now let me say this slowly and clearly, for this is the secret of the life that relates to the animal side of us. Any morsel of food that goes down the throat, unsalivated and unmasticated, is poison. It will cause disease. It will give the machine too much work to do and the machine not doing it, the food will putrefy, decompose, decay and form a breeding ground, a nesting place for deadly germs. You need never err in regard to this. If food is not masticated in the mouth, the stomach is not able to deal with it and life is thereby shortened and generally embittered. 
But, says the average man, it would take me an hour to eat my dinner if I had to chew everything to a fluid. Yes, adds his friend, or two hours. Exactly. It might take you four hours, but that only shows that the food is the wrong sort. If a man eats properly cooked good food, he ought to be able to do the eating for 24 hours in one hour or less. If he eats as he ought to eat, he will find that two meals a day are plenty and that would give him half an hour to each meal, but the wise man will take longer than that. He that eats slowly will be able to work fast and live long. As Horace Fletcher says, quote, Unless a person has a pressing engagement with his own funeral, what sense is there in hurrying with his meals? Unquote. But we all hurry over our meals. Let me say this carefully. Disease is the result of dirt. All disease is the result of dirt. The dirt has reached the blood and the blood is the life. When a man swallows any form of food which has not been properly salivated and chewed and reduced to pulp, he is swallowing dirt. The grizzle, the skin and tasteless stuff that is swallowed is dirt and the machine cannot deal with it. Thus we have disease. All disease is due to dirt, to matter which the system cannot get rid of. If you chew your food, you will have no disease. This may seem so simple as to be silly, but it is God's truth. All disease is the result of improper mastication and the disregard of taste in food. No Breakfast or The Secret of Life by Gossip Thomas C. Lothian Chapter 9 Self-Control one half of the secret of life is to eat when you are hungry and never at any other time. The other half is summed up in the words self-control. Some people think that the secret of life is going without your breakfast and only eating twice a day or once a day. Some believe that vegetarianism is the secret of life or temperance or physical drill or Christian science or metaphysics, but each and every one is wrong unless they include the statement that a man must be master of his own soul. This may be called a new doctrine, but it has been taught by all the mighty teachers of earth. In Ecclesiastes X16 it says, Woe unto thee, O land, when thy princes eat in the morning. What about the woe that comes to your land where everybody eats in the morning? When the breakfast is the chief meal of the day? Woe has come to the land right enough. Our hospitals are crowded, our streets are thick with doctors and drugstores, and very few people are really well. And we all eat in the morning. In Ecclesiastes X17, it says, Blessed art thou, O land, when thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. What are our great dinner parties for? Are they for strength or drunkenness? Why do we eat? Because the bell rings or the havo strikes. We go to our meals because we love to eat. There are gluttons in our land who measure all places by the ability of cook or the quantity of food. There are people who live in hotels and boarding houses who eat as much as they can to get the worth of their money. Very few eat for strength. We eat for custom. But the blessing comes to those who eat in due season for strength. Do we do it? Morning tea, forenoon tea, afternoon tea and supper. What are they for? Strength? Nay, for lust of eating. A man should be master of his own soul. He should be master of his appetites or drinkatites and smokatites. But who is? Old Lavozi, the Chinaman who lived centuries before Christ, said, 
He who overcomes others is strong, but he who conquers himself is mighty. Yeah, verily. And our own scriptures say, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Amen. It is no new doctrine I preach. Every man should be master of his own soul and should control his own appetites, his passions, lusts, desires, tempers. The kingdom of heaven is within us. We dream of it in our ignorance as a place that is far away beyond the clouds and beyond the tomb. Yet when the Pharisees asked the Master 1900 years ago where this fabled country existed, the answer was simple. There were no geologic, astronomic, scientific quibblings. There were no higher criticism doubts. The answer was simple and true, as true today as then. No higher criticism can ever interfere with the truth. The reply was, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And the new gospel which I preach today is the same. The kingdom of God is within you. Ye make or mar yourselves. We are the arbiters of our own destiny, but we fail to realize that, and so we eat for drunkenness instead of strength, and our land is sorely troubled. And this new doctrine is older than all our teaching. It was not new when the Buddha of India cried. Ah, brothers, sisters, seek not from the helpless gods by gift nor hymn, nor bribe with blood, nor feed with fruit and cakes. Within yourselves deliverance must be sought. Each man his prison makes. And this is what makes the secret of life. We make or mar ourselves. The good God sends sorrow to none, sickness to none. We make our own ills. All earth's sorrows are man-made and nursed on human laps. The fathers ate sore grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. And this is new? Nay, verily, it is old, very old. Omar Khayyam taught the same thing as all the other mighty ones and he lived and died in Persia over 800 years ago. He said, I sent my soul through the invisible, some letter of that afterlife to spell, and by and by my soul returned to me and answered, I myself am heaven and hell. All the mighty teachers have declared unto us the same thing. And we know in bitter moments that reaping and sowing are bound together. When we suffer, we know that we suffer from ourselves. Nobody compels us to suffer, but we are born into a foolish and accursed system of pharisaism and hypocrisy and we go helplessly after our leaders, bleating blindly towards the night of death. When Epictetus, the Roman slave, was teaching philosophy in Rome in the bloody days of Nero, he said the only true man is he who is master of his own soul. He who is master of his appetites, desires, passions is master of life, I, and of death itself. But Epictetus knew that the masses of Rome were as ignorant of themselves as we are of ourselves, and he said, Whoever is ignorant of what he is, and wherefore he was born, and in what kind of a world he is, and what things are good, and what are evil, will wander up and down, entirely deaf and blind, supposing himself to be somebody, while he is in reality nobody. That sounds more than Carlyle than a Roman slave, but there always have been some true souls in the world calling others to the light and Epictetus was one of them. Here we are in this 20th century, lost in the mists of ignorance, all calling for light or for help or for others to do something, and we ourselves are lost. We are not masters of our own selves. 
We each have a nostrum to save the country, but each man runs when the dinner bell rings. We are bound up with hideous social customs which are working as ruin and we mourn over the evil that is impending. But we are not even masters of our own stomachs. We are the slaves of tea or beer or dinner or tobacco or whiskey or fashion. We dare not move out unless we are dressed in a becoming manner. Some women more than men are such absolute slaves to their toilets that they spend most of their time on earth thinking about their looks. Poor, degraded, miserable slaves. And there are men slaving from morn to night, from year's end to year's end, to gain, what? Luxuries, which bring only weariness to the flesh. The simple things of life, such as food and shelter, are very inexpensive, and the kingdom of God is within us. We have no time to live because we are working for the things which are unnecessary. Men slave so for wealth that they have no time to eat, no time to masticate, no time to live. But they swallow their food as something that is absolutely necessary and away they go to pipe or cigar or toil. And for what? What is life? Why do we live? Why do we die? As Scopen Hure says, this is such a bad world that if things were atmospherically only a very little different, human life would be impossible. Therefore, this is the very worst kind of a world possible. But we don't believe that if we have control of ourselves, of our minds and our stomachs. This is a good world if we have the kingdom of God in our own hearts. And because we have failed to realize the teaching of the masters, we have followed blindly after scope and here and the pessimists, if not in word, in deed. Now let me recapitulate. All disease comes from the blood. If we have bad blood, we have disease. If we have good blood, we have good health. All our diseases come from impure blood, either directly or indirectly. Every man can purify his own blood by taking thought to his life. All blood, which is the life, is produced by the stomach. And unless we keep the stomach in good working order, the blood will be bad. Every morsel of food taken into the system must be properly digested or else it decomposes and sets up disease. Where the disease manifests itself depends on our hereditary tendencies or existing weaknesses. It may be in our eyes, in our ears, our throat, back, lungs or liver. It may be in rheumatism, Bright's disease, diabetes or lumbago. But the source and cause of the trouble is the blood. Colds, influenza, pneumonia, plague are all but manifestations of disease. No germs can live in pure blood. Good blood is the best germicide in the world. A morsel of undigested food is a disease in process. When a man eats before he is hungry, it shows that the stomach is not clear. Before eating, the teeth should be watering, for the first step in the digestive process is salivation. No man's teeth are ever watering for breakfast. Breakfast is an accursed meal, for the glands of the mouth and the stomach are torpid and not ready for digestion. Yet, driven by the habits of the race, we eat and suffer. No man or woman or child should ever eat for several hours after rising. And no human being should ever eat more than twice a day. And nobody should ever eat except for strength. Eating without appetite or without hunger is eating for drunkenness. The scriptures are expressive. If you want to be healthy, never eat till you are hungry in your mouth. And if you have to wait a week or a fortnight for that, it will do you no harm. When a man or woman has no appetite, don't coax them to eat. Don't make things to tempt their attempt. Nature has put the loathing for food as a sentry on the stomach and we push the sentry aside with dainties and then we wonder why our loved ones are diseased.
But no breakfast is only half the remedy. We need to gain control of ourselves. We need to be masters of our own stomachs. When the stomach sinks and craves and cries all gone, don't heed it. You need to be the arbiter, the master, the controller. You need to be able to say, no breakfast today, then no lunch today and then no dinner today. When a man takes his several passions under his own control and all his animal appetites, then he is rising to a knowledge of the truth which makes him free. That is when a man begins to master himself. The simple life means but this, that a man shall be master of his own soul, of his own body, of his own mind. And when can a man be master of himself when he is the slave of his appetites? The secret of life is summed up in the words self-control. He who has learned to control himself is a master of his own fate, master of life, I, master of death itself. And the secret of life is a self-control. Self-control for rightness, self-control for righteousness. No breakfast or the secret of life by Gossip Thomas C. Lothian Chapter 10 Four Years After A man said to me one day, Will that no breakfast trick do me any good? I responded promptly, Not the least. And I meant it, for he was a wine bibber and a lascivious selfish mortal who was suffering for his sins and only wanted to be better in order that he might sin some more. For such men, this booklet has no message at all, and I want to explain matters after the experience of four years. When a man takes to a new idea at the age of 57, it is safe to assume that whatever good results from it will not be due to his youth and health. At that age, I was an old man, full of disease and creeping down to the cheerless grave, feeling that life had been a failure. After four years' experience, now nearly 62 years of age, I laugh, for I have become a young man. All my aches and pains have fled away. Rheumatic gout, lumbago, neuritis and indigestion are ghostly memories and now I play golf with all the zest of a small boy playing marbles. I laugh at my juvenility, but never try to check it, for it is a most delightful feeling at my age. I work more now, write more now and do more business than I ever did in my life and enjoy every hour. And all this from no breakfast. But it is not enough to simply do without breakfast. I have been ill several times since I started and yet I have never taken breakfast. There is a good deal more to the secret than simply eliminating a meal. A man can take only one meal a day and yet be a physical wreck. But that, I think, has been fairly explained in the booklet. What I want to explain now as the result of a practical experience is that every man has it in his own hands to be well if he has the will. And the remedy for the ills of life costs nothing. In fact, it saves money, but it takes a deal of grit. However, the story of one of my failures will be more illuminative than anything else. Not very long ago, there came to the city a great literary lion, and I happened to get acquainted with him. I took him one night to the Institute of Journalists and introduced him to the boys. They drank his health and sang, He is a jolly good fellow, and I joined in. I drank whiskey and soda, for I am no bigot, no crank, no ascetic. I used to drink whiskey and soda, and one little glass couldn't do a man any harm surely, especially when he was a no-breakfaster. I enjoyed the drink very much, for it was a novelty. Then I took a cigar, just one and I had smoked all my life, so there was no harm in one cigar. It was a nice one too, done up in tissue paper and silver. 
I enjoyed that also for I had not smoked for a long time and the company was interesting. They were all intellectual men and as smart as they make them. Some of them were in bad health and thought that was the visitation of God, but I knew better. It was the visitation of the devil with the most of them. And we are our own devils. After the function at the club, the lion and I went to his hotel and drank black coffee and yarned. He smoked cigarettes all the time, but that is one infamy to which I had never descended. We had a good time for he was a great man and wonderfully clever so that it made a really delightful night. As I went homewards, I wondered why I did not go out more frequently and enjoy the society of literary men. Next morning Saturday, I arose with a bitter sense of burden and unfitness. My wife was very sympathetic for I had failed to tell her all we had done on the previous night. She thought that a man of sixty would have sense enough to do the right thing and she never dreamed that her husband was such a fool as to do what he did. So, not knowing what I had done, she was, as I have said, sympathetic. Sunday I was worse yet and she was surprised that a man who was no breakfaster should be so much out of sorts. But I was not greatly surprised when I came to think out the law of cause and effect. I gave up eating on the Sunday and took nothing more in the way of food till the following Tuesday when I felt all right again. Then I wrote to the lion and said things. I explained that he was an ass, for he had been very ill of late and had suffered untold agonies. I had cleansed my blood during the last three years and now nicotine and alcohol were deadly poisons. The night with him had broken me up entirely and poisoned my system and being an older man than he was, I realized that I was a bigger fool. When I had written that letter, I handed it to my mate, who read it and looked at me reproachfully. She said, You never told me what you had done. I replied, No dear, I didn't want to confess. I hated to tell what a fool I had been. It is easy preaching, but when it comes to practice, it is not half as easy. A man can fool his wife, he can fool his neighbors, yes, he can fool himself but he can't fool nature. He can dodge man, but he can't dodge God. I used to think it was Sunday school talk when anybody quoted, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. But it is written in the soul of things, and a man is punished by his sins every time. I was brought up to believe that a man was punished for his sins, and he might dodge the punishment if he was a smart. Experience has taught me that a man is punished by his sins and there is no dodging the penalty. You put your sin into the penny in the slot machine and you get your trouble out as sure as death. There may be times when the individual fails to get the lolly that he paid for, but it comes even unto the third and fourth generation. You never can escape it. Forgive me for preaching, but the facts are simple. If any man takes up this fad under the impression that it is easy and simple, he will soon find that it is a mistake. It is the most difficult thing in the world to be different from the people about you. Most people are fools and slaves to the customs of the race. When I was very ill and unable to eat, my wife used to make me little dainties to tempt my appetite. I could not eat much, but I had dainties frequently to keep my strength up. If that dear woman had allowed me to fast for a week and give nature a chance, I would have been healed of all my sicknesses, but neither of us knew that. We had grown up in a world of ignorance and never dreamed that there are some diseases that go out only by prayer and fasting. We had heard these words, but they didn't mean anything to us. So I suffered. We both suffered and no man ever told us that fasting was a salvation. Not long ago I heard that a man in the bush had taken to the no breakfast fad and it had nearly killed him. Whereat I laughed. 
It nearly kills lots of people who have failed to read the real meaning of no breakfast. Dropping a meal is only a minor part of the secret. A man needs self-control. The man who had suffered from trying the remedy was under the impression that dropping the meal was the cure. He did without his breakfast all right, but he kept thinking about poor little Mary all afternoon till he was fairly ravenous at lunchtime and gorged himself to make up for the lost meal. He did that two or three times, then nature rebelled and smote him. Then he blamed no breakfast. The simple remedy for the ills of the flesh is to eat as little as possible, consistent with getting the best work out of the machine. But it is not easy to find that out, for the false appetite which has been cultivated in us will insist on calling itself hunger. To find out how little one really needs is difficult indeed. And the temptations to overeat are enormous. The very love of our kin and our friends makes them protest against our extraordinary conduct. After four years' experience, I find that taking no breakfast is alright, but a hearty lunch is a mistake. I prefer to have a plate of porridge for lunch and some bread and butter, then a light dinner at night, but I feel that the midday lunch, even of porridge, is too much. I am surprised to learn how little a man really needs to keep up strength. But every man has got to learn this for himself. It is a revelation to me, but that is of no use to another man. Every man must have a revelation to himself. And this can only come through sore travail of soul. But for myself, I am sure that simple living is the secret of life.